Well, do we have to talk about the Oscars? It was a joke that probably shouldn't have been made. It was physical violence that probably shouldn't have happened. And it is an example of our popular obsession with celebrities that has again overshadowed more important issues in the world. There were important things that happened in that last week, but all anybody could talk about was the slap heard around the world. But I have to say, and my wife found an article that articulated this very well, this probably isn't even the worst thing to ever have happened at the Oscars, if you think back about the history of the Oscars. To just give you one example, when Gone with the Wind was up for Best Picture and Hattie McDaniel, who played the mammy in that, was up for Best Supporting Actress, the Oscars and the Academy had to get special permission to, for her to even enter the hotel because it was a race-restricted hotel. And she had to sit at a table in the back with her agent and not with her co-stars of the movie to then come up and receive her statue for Best Supporting Actress. So there have been worse things at the Oscars than what happened this past week. At the same time, I could not have chosen an incident to highlight the issue I wanted to talk about already, which is this question of the ethics of humor. With the advent of our new awareness of social justice issues, the concepts and realities of privilege, of structural inequality, of microaggressions, of trigger warnings, you know, you have a new awareness of what could upset people in the comedic realm or just about any walk of life. But we've also heard a number of complaints about the death of comedy or cancel culture that is simply eliminating any joy in life, where one mistake, even in the distant past, could mean the end of your career. Now, I have to say, in many cases, when an incident like this comes out, the video goes viral, there are public apologies, there are mea culpas and sensitivity trainings, and life moves on. I don't know that people are as canceled as people think people are. And now I don't read Entertainment Weekly, I don't watch Bravo's nightly TV show, so I they have limited knowledge in how that works, but I don't think it's as bad as people have said. Now, I will say, and probably this is a good thing, we are more cautious about our language. We're learning what it means to follow someone's preferred pronouns what it means to use more inclusive vocabulary, uh, to put things in plural instead of he and she for the non-binary, for example. And it seems to me that there are still a lot of funny people out there who are still doing funny things. So the death of comedy has been much exaggerated, as supposedly Mark Twain said when he saw his obituary in the paper. Rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. I think the same is true for comedy. Just to give you some names of people who are still on late night comedy shows even today, Stephen Colbert, James Corden, Trevor Noah, Samantha Bee, John Oliver, Seth Meyers, Andy Cohen, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Bill Maher, they are all still on TV regularly, even if they do get people upset. And I'll point out that eight of those 10 names I listed are still white men too, and they're still on TV. Now the ethics of humor is not about what you can get away with or what you can survive. Ethics is about doing better. It's your best behavior, what you should do. And so I want to give you f five either ors to consider, and we'll have a chance to talk about each one as we go along. The first either or is the distinction between laughing at and laughing with. This is something you have to train your children at very early on. It's sort of the reverse of the old line where if I fall down, it's tragedy. If you fall down, it's comedy. But really, the way it works with kids is if you see someone fall down and they laugh at themselves, then it's okay to laugh. But if they fall down and they're hurt and they're upset, then it's not okay to laugh. That's laughing at, not laughing with. Now, sometimes we can laugh at ourselves. I mean, if you go to a roast, you better expect you're going to get it. And to be honest, most celebrities at the Oscars expect a little bit of ribbing as part of the experience, as part of the shtick of the Oscar host is to make fun of all the stars that are there. Um, but many comedians draw on their own lives when they're doing their routines. They're talking about their mothers, they're talking about their family, their spouse, their own experiences, the stupid things they themselves did. And so if they're laughing at themselves, then we're allowed to laugh with them at them. But pointing at that group over there, or that person over there, and laughing at them when they're not laughing, what you're laughing at. That's laughing at. 
No, we have to remind people now, turn off your cell phones. It didn't matter when it was all on Zoom. <laughs> you see, the laughing at challenge is tricky because you can't always know your audience's humor tolerance. And so what you really need to do is to increase your sense of empathy, to look at this from other eyes. How might other people think about this joke, about this routine, about this uh, story that I'm going to tell? So I'll give you just one example. For a long time, a staple element of the Purim spiel, the retelling of the Purim story in a comic vein, was to dress men up in dresses. Because wasn't that hilarious? And there was a TV show in the 80s called Bosom Buddies, where the premise was there are two men who are hiding out living in a women's hotel or apartment building, so they have to dress as women all the time. And isn't that funny? Well, for people who are transgender or for people who um, don't fit into neat gender roles, that's mocking them. It's not simply, oh, isn't it funny to see a man in a dress? And so Purim spiels have had to adapt, and people who do them have had to think more sensitively about what kind of humor are we using, and is it really appropriate given our audience? And was it ever appropriate understanding now what we didn't understand then? So have you ever had an experience where you were stuck on that line of laughing at versus laughing with, or maybe you accidentally tipped over that line, or you were on the wrong side of being laughed at instead of being laughed with? Does, does anybody have a, a story they'd be willing to share about the experience of the distinction between laughing at and laughing with? Well, <clears throat> I have often said the same thing. Whenever they have a TV show where they show the funniest videos, the majority that they show are people falling somewhere. And I have never been able to say that's funny. Mm -hmm. How many people have wound up in hospitals because of that show? Anyone else have a perspective on laughing at or laughing with, either here or online? About a year and a half ago, I was at a convention and there was a panel on Monty Python. I'm a big Monty Python fan. I really enjoy Monty Python. But the panelists pointed out that Monty Python was not particularly LGBTQ friendly and was frequently making fun of gay people, even though some of the members of the troupe were, in fact, although not out, uh, were gay. And it really made me rethink, because I really hadn't looked at it from that perspective, um, uh, an area of comedy that I really enjoyed. Just, uh, we're, we're talking about um, jokes and things that have to be careful who you're going to upset or who you're going to irritate. One of my favorite quotes from all time is the, uh, the now late folk singer, Pete Seeger, who over the course of his life was involved in a lot of protests and a lot of, and an interviewer once asked him, why is it he always sings protest songs? And his response was, every song's a protest song if you sing it at the right time in the right place. Uh, my husband and I have a comedy show and sometimes it's unscripted and sometimes it's scripted. And one of, or a couple of the things that we include in our writing process is, first of all, if there's ever a joke that we're on the fence about, it gets run by other people in the group. And having a diverse group of writers helps us kind of tease out some of those situations where, you know, it's like, okay, is this laughing with or laughing at, you know, is this a joke that, you know, I would tell? Um, the other thing that I think has been important in writing has been, you know, if anybody gets a script or, or sees a script or sees a show and there's a joke in there that nobody else caught, um, and they say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that. There's no argument, there's no back and forth, there's no trying to convince them, but it's so funny when, like, that's just it. If it's punching down, if it's, you know, any, any kind of question, we'd really rather err on the side of just skipping the joke and, you know, not maybe being as successful at making a couple people laugh than to have people come to our show and be hurt or embarrassed or unwelcome in any way. There are a lot of other options out there, right? If you've got a hundred jokes to choose from, then don't choose. 
that you don't choose some of them. And we'll talk a little bit about punching up and punching down in a little bit. So let's look at another opposition that was laughing at versus laughing with. Then another one is then and now. What was once funny may no longer be funny. And what you laughed at 30 years ago, maybe you're not as comfortable laughing at. I also have a Monty Python example for this, as it turns out. Um, just a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, um, it was the 40th anniversary of the release of Monty Python's The Life of Brian. And it went back into theaters. And my son uh, decided he really likes Monty Python. He loved The Quest for the Holy Grail. So I said, okay, I'll take him to go see The Life of Brian in theater. It's such a funny movie. And there were still parts that were very funny and we were laughing, but then there were some parts that were uncomfortable, given our values today. Um, in 1979, when the film originally came out, it was protested because it was making fun of the Jesus story. And 40 years later, nobody takes that seriously enough in this area to protest. The th there was no sign of any protest at any of the theaters in this area about this film because we've moved on so much and been willing to laugh at some of those pieties. But there was one scene in the film that I remember rolling on the ground at the first time I'd seen it. But it's a scene that mocks speech impediments and makes fun of someone that can't pronounce his R's. And then shortly afterwards, someone else who can't pronounce his S's and has a lisp. And at the time, that was hilarious. But we just don't do that today. And I was physically uncomfortable at that moment in the theater, both seeing that they were trying to make that joke, but also realizing that I used to think that was funny. Now I think about it a little bit differently. And the same is true with a famous scene in almost everybody's favorite movie, The Princess Bride. You may remember there's a scene where there is a priest who is about to officiate at a wedding. And he begins it by saying, marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. I don't laugh at that scene. And I actually got into a somewhat heated discussion with some people online that were part of a humanist efficient Facebook group because they said, I'd be fine if a wedding couple wanted me to start the ceremony that way. And I said, no way. That's, how, can you, how could you be okay with that? Because you're... And they say, no, 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 it's just, it's making, it's like laughing with the movie. It's not making fun of people with a speech impediment. And I said, well, then why do they make fun of the way he says ring later in the ceremony? I mean, it, it's, to me, clearly making fun of a disability. And we just don't do that anymore. So I'm curious for your example, if you have any, of things that you used to laugh at or that were funny a long time ago that you just don't laugh at today because of new experiences and new values. We have a comment back here. Three television shows come to mind. All in the Family, Samford and Son, and um, The Jeffersons. All three of those shows were what, 1970s, 1980s? They were all based on stereotypes. How would they play today? I think when I, years ago they did a live redo of an All in the Family episode, um, and they chose one just, and again, it was interesting to see how it played in modern times. You can actually find a lot of those episodes online, you know, streaming or on YouTube, and uh, some of them do still, do still play reasonably well. It's, uh, it's surprising how well some of them held up, but you're right that some of them would definitely have And some of those shows have um, had, had requested some of their episodes be removed. You cannot find certain episodes from some of those shows are, right. are no longer see, available. Someone online has a comment to offer. Leora. When I, when I was a kid, um, my mother was told she had no sense of humor because she disliked vehemently any slapstick, any jokes against any ethnic group. Um, she was really... And, and I did not understand why she was against all of these things. But she was really ahead of her time in her dislike of these things. And it's only over time that I've come to appreciate her viewpoint on that. Okay. Well, let's look at another um, alternative, either or, to consider. And that is inside jokes versus outside jokes. And who is telling the joke? 
some people are very taken with a streaming show called The Adventures of Mrs. Maisel, right? Or The Amazing Mrs. Maisel. I don't even know because I don't watch it. Uh, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. There we go. Um, and some people love that show. They find it hilarious and moving and resonant. And there are other people who find it stereotyped and clunky and artificial and contrived. And they're also a little put off by the fact that the actress who plays Mrs. Maisel grew up in Highland Park, but is not Jewish. Some people might not even know that. Or I think about a show called The Goldbergs, where I actually did a little research on this show, and all but one of the members of the Goldberg family is not Jewish. One of them actually has the last name of Gentile, <laughs> as it works out. Gentile, probably Italian. But uh, th the point is that you know who is telling the joke, who is acting Jewish on screen, might make you feel different about it. But even there are jokes that we might tell among ourselves with our loved ones that we might not be comfortable going out there in public. I'll give you one example. I've told this once or twice before, so if you've heard it uh, before, you can humor me and laugh. The Yeshiva University rowing team is having a terrible time. They are losing every single race, and so they decide to figure out how to actually run a rowing team, and they send one of their members to watch the Harvard-Yale regatta um, competition. And the uh, crew member comes back and he says, guys, we've got it all backwards. We need one person yelling and eight people rowing. <laughs> now, Jews can laugh about that sort of amongst ourselves because we know how much we talk and how much we argue with each other and how the argument can take over doing what we actually have to do, which is row the darn boat. But if someone were to say that at the Oscars, <laughs> Or if someone were to tell that joke to a non-Jewish in a church setting or something, you know, there, there would be a setting where that would feel very uncomfortable. We might even consider it anti-Semitic to tell a story like that in a non-Jewish setting without a Jewish storyteller or without a Jewish audience, or at least a, a partially Jewish or somewhat Jewish audience to hear the joke. So we have to find that balance of inside and outside um, and appreciate that sometimes there are outsiders in the room and appreciate also that sometimes we are the outsider and we have to think about things differently. So has anyone ever had an experience with humor like that, where there was an insider-outsider dynamic that made them particularly uncomfortable? Yes, here in the room. Yeah, this was a number of years ago, and I, I was at a, a dinner that included some friends and family, and people were telling some sort of self-deprecating jokes, and I made a, a joke that had to do with being Jewish, and it was, it was kind of funny and um people laughed and then somebody who was not jewish was at the dinner followed it up with a bunch of jokes about being jewish and it was just completely the wrong jokes from the wrong person and um, i was offended and many other people were and he had no idea that it was any different than me telling the joke that i told so yeah there was also that seinfeld episode where someone converted so we could tell the jokes finally <laughs> Along those lines, the comedian uh, John Mulaney, Mulaney was married to a Jewish woman and made jokes about that experience. Then he cheated on her and had a, had, a, had a baby with someone else. And in retrospect, those jokes look sound real different when you realize what his behavior was later. Well, if you remember um, Saturday Night Live from the 1980s, Mike Myers played this woman named Linda Richmond, who was a stereotypically Jewish woman. It's based on his mother-in-law. Uh, so he's, he's coming by it naturally. But again, it has that sort of, is this mocking, or is this, is this inside, or is this outside? The uh, comedy team uh, Stella and Mira, when they first started, it was a Jewish man and a, uh, I think, an Irish Catholic woman. And their entire routine was about the differences in their culture and making fun of her trying to pronounce Jewish words and him trying to understand Catholic ceremonies. Right, but they came by it honestly, right? They, yeah, they, they, okay. And they gave permission to do that. You know, I've, I've actually, I saw a uh, disabled comedian who started his routine and said, it's okay to laugh at me laughing at me. And he sort of gave permission at the outset. So when you have a Jewish person making fun of the Jewish stuff with his spouse who is not Jewish, and like that's giving you permission to laugh in that setting that maybe um, is breaking down that barrier between insider and outsider. So um, Dave Chappelle being in the news about the, the, his 
kind of comedy show that was really just kind of a lecture about trans people put me in mind of when he left Chappelle's show and the, you know, the show that he had on Comedy Central for a couple of years. And there was some behind the scenes issues about the contracts and how he was being paid. But one of the things that he said about why he left when it happened or when he was interviewed after he returned to the public uh, eye was that he realized that he's telling the, like the whole show, if you've watched it, is a sketch comedy that's about the difficulty of being a black person in the United States. And what he realized was that his audience was predominantly white college students who are watching these black actors tell jokes about what it's like to be black and then repeating them without any of the context. And that's what drove him to, it's part of what drove him to end the show. And it's part of what kind of frustrated me with the way that he's defended himself more recently because you're doing the same thing to those people and you don't see it. It's really frustrating. Yeah. So let's look at another one. This is punching up versus punching down. A hundred years ago, there was a phenomenon called muckraking journalists. And they self-defined with this phrase of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. That is, if you are downtrodden, you will be uplifted. If you are successful, you'll have to pay the piper, especially if you've gotten it by ill-gotten means. In the abstract, which is likelier to be funnier? A joke about a rich person or a joke about a poor person? A joke about someone with a master's degree in philosophy or a joke about a high school dropout? A joke about a member of Congress or a joke about a person who's in prison? In general, we tend to feel more comfortable laughing at those more privileged people because they can take it, so to speak, um, but also because we don't want to feel like we're laughing down. It's again that laughing at dynamic is uh, another way of saying punching down. Um, as one example of sort of equal opportunity insult, John F. Kennedy was supposedly um, credited with saying that Washington, D.C. is the worst of both worlds. It has northern manners and southern efficiency. <laughs> and what I love about that joke is it's making fun of the North and the South, but it's also complimenting the North and the South because it's saying the North is actually efficient, the South has good manners. I mean, this is again, during segregation times, we have to ask for whom were these manners directed? You know, maybe it's worth criticizing a bit. Uh, but again, it's sort of an equal opportunity thing. It's not punching up or punching down, so to speak. Um, punching up can also be offensive. It can rely on stereotypes. It can be prejudiced. And we should accept that too. We should understand that punching up, uh, punching in general probably is not a good metaphor for what we're trying to do with this uh, phenomenon. Uh, but it's worth considering which one are you doing with your joke. And sometimes, you know, the group you may think is up still feels vulnerable. You know, sometimes I've heard people describe even making jokes about Jewish people as punching up because they are of a higher income across the board demographically. If you look at different religious or ethnic groups, Jews tend to earn more, they have more college degrees, they're more uh, um, socioeconomically successful. So that's punching up if you make fun of them. But Jews feel vulnerable as victims of anti-Semitism and of anti-Semitic violence even in the last 12 months. We've seen it in Texas and in other places as well. So thinking about that group dynamic and thinking about punching up and punching down is another challenge that comedy faces, but I think that we also face as we're interacting with people. We might not think of someone as being down, and so we think we're punching up, but in fact, it may go both ways. So I'm curious if anyone else has had experience either seeing comedians deal with that punching up, punching down dynamic, or um, have uh, had a story like that uh, in their own experience. This is kind of that, and also actually going back to the first one of the, uh, the first part of, of uh, uh, what is and isn't funny. Um, so the, the comedy show that we produce is modeled after uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. And um, I'm, a, I have varying degrees of, of closeness with the people who made with uh, that show and one of them is someone I follow uh, we, we follow each other on Twitter and a few years ago uh, he told a joke that involved a slur for transgender people it he didn't mean it that way it was a tranny the transvestite was the punchline of the joke 
And he got called out on it and he balked at first. And then after a little bit, he thought about it and he came back with what I thought was what like a really good apology for it. Like genuinely, this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to hurt these people. I don't want my fans to feel like that, that, that if they're in this group or in a smaller minority that I feel comfortable making them feel unwelcome, unsafe, whatever. And so, yeah, he came back with a really good apology for that. And it was, it comes up in the fandom every so often of whether we should even be editing ourselves as because jokes are sanct, sacrosanct. But I thought that he handled that particular thing really well as, and, um, and understood the punching up, punching down dynamic. Right. I see that uh, Sandra and William have a hand up online. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, I uh, run a, a blog, the Bolingbrook Babbler, that uh, I do have to be conscious about uh, how I punch at. It's a satirical site, so I always try to like laugh at people I think are in power and uh, maybe abusing it, but and I have to keep in mind, uh, especially when I'm looking at a subject, uh, is that, am I punching down? Is that person really up? So the it's something I have to think about a lot when I do, when I write my stories. Right. So one more either or, and this one is thick skin for you, thin skin for me. You know, people say, ah, oh, just grow a thicker skin, you know, get tougher. You, the world is tough. You just have to suck it up and deal with it. But when you attack them <laughs> or where you talk about their group, then they feel totally justified in reacting as vehemently as possible. Roxane Gay actually wrote a very interesting piece about this in the New York Times in the last week um, about this dynamic of thick skin and thin skin. I've learned in my life, both in private life and public life, that you can't really tell someone else when they should or should not be offended or to be upset. I mean, one of the least useful phrases in English is, don't be upset. It's second to um, no offense, but that's meaningless. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're going to say no offense before you say something, don't bother. <laughs> you probably don't say the second thing either. You could explain why you didn't intend the offense, but in the end, if the person is upset, the proper answer is, I'm sorry you're upset, and I'm sorry, thank you for educating me into what I did that upset you and maybe we can avoid it in the future. You know, you have um, Purim costumes that sometimes show up that are really, really offensive. Um, and you've seen these sometimes make the rounds on social media where people dress up for Purim, they think they're being funny and they put on blackface. Oh, thank you. Preset and it should move right now. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Now you're on camera. Um, you have uh, people who dress up in Purim costumes in blackface and they think they're being really funny. And you point out to them, this is offensive, and they say, oh, come on, it's harmless fun, they should have a thicker skin. But then you make any hint of anything that whiffs like anti-Semitism, and the pitchforks come out, and the torches, and the ADL, and the press releases, and it's over the top. So this is, again, that thick skin for them, thin skin for me. But if we're sensitive to things that insult us, then we have to be open to being sensitive on behalf of other people. And we have to realize that if we do something wrong, there's the defensiveness, the fight back response versus apology and reparation. And if you were paying attention on Yom Kippur, any one of the last umpteen years of your life that you observed Yom Kippur, ideally we should do better at apology and reparation and repairing those relationships, not fighting back, not arguing, but finding a way to repair those connections. So. I'm curious if anyone has had the experience of being told, oh, you shouldn't be offended by that joke. We had one example uh, from a dinner party, but maybe there are other stories or experiences you had where someone told a joke and you got offended and the response was not, I'm sorry, or oh, I, I now realize that's a problem, but the response was, uh, suck it up, grow a thick skin. Anyone have experiences like that? Yes, Leora, please. Yeah, in the business world, women, Get upset at something that a man says and he says to her, oh, grow up. Oh, don't be so sensitive. Oh, get a thicker skin. And 
this didn't just happen when I was in business, which I left in 2001. It's still happening today. I had a long conversation with a friend of mine who's still in the food industry and still experiencing it. My daughter talks about it. It, it is for all a consciousness raising that has happened in the last 50 years, it hasn't made a dent in for many men, I'm not going to say all, but many men in the business world who just tell you, oh, you're overly sensitive. What is your problem? He didn't mean anything by it. Still pisses me off. Mm -hmm. Uh, hold on, uh, Marjorie here and then Judy online. Something that I've always wondered about in modern times is when somebody says something offensive, person A, person B gets offended, and person A says to person B, well, I am so sorry that you were upset by what I said. And the, the, the intention of that is, I didn't say anything strange, unusual, hurtful, but you, you got upset. So I'm not really apologizing to you. I am blaming you. That's a fair point, a fair point. Yes, Judy. Uh, you mentioned uh, something about blackface and it just brought to mind when I was young uh, and this we're talking years ago uh, <laughs> how many girl, little girls would dress up as Aunt Jemima with the black face for Halloween and nobody thought anything of it now I'm talking uh, many years ago nowadays I don't think anyone would do that and also uh, things are really changing because look at how many teams are going away from the Indian names to other names. So many of them are changing their names nowadays because of, you know, you can't say anything like, uh, I think it was the Cleveland Indians that are no longer the Cleveland Indians. Uh, I mean, we are, we are changing. Yes, there has been change. Although you may have also seen a story in the news in the last month of a uh, high school te uh, pep team, pep rally team from Texas, uh, who are the Indians, I think is their team name, and they did a very uh, brown face or red face, I guess, if you want to be offensive, um, portrayal as a dance routine at Disney World that was recorded and uh, seen by many, many people, uh, including war whoops and tomahawk chops and all kinds of terrible stuff. Um, and Disney, of course, got egg on their face from this, and they they claimed we had no idea that they were going to do this. It turns out they've done that same routine there for several years, and the high school in Texas has no intention of changing their name or any of their hallowed traditions. Um, so there has been progress, absolutely, in some places, and there are still some parts of the world that are resistant. Well, I want to uh, sort of draw this to a close. We have a couple other last uh, comments um, and any last comments online as well. It would have been okay. Um, I think that this comes into play a lot when we kind of start to think of group membership in tiers. And, you know, it's more offensive to make fun of somebody for their race than, um, you know, their hair color or something like that. You know, I mean, if you make, you know, a carrot top joke, you know, I mean, he rolls with it. Like, that's his shtick. But, um, you know, there are there are groups that people belong to that I don't think that other people realize what that lived experience is like. And so that's when you see people, you know, still thinking it's totally fine to make fat jokes, not realizing that, you know, the lived experience of being fat is very, very different. Um, you see people making jokes about people living in really destitute conditions and calling them horrible things like trailer trash or, you know, things like that, which, you know, is still fairly socially acceptable because as long as you don't live that experience, you know, you really don't have an idea of what that's like. So it, I think it's really kind of a matter of stratifying um, oppression, which is kind of a really awful thing, awful way to kind of 
approach people? I think it's also a dynamic of us and them, you know, that maybe making fun of them is easier than accepting uh, humor directed at us. And part of the ambition of a humanistic approach to life is that the us is everybody. Uh, and so then they're all in our orbit of concern. They're all part of the people we don't want to make fun of. We don't want to be laughing at, we want to be laughing with instead. Well, I have a last either or comparison to offer, and that is, what do we do when something like this happens? When we see it, we experience it. And that's another distinction between calling out and calling in. When you call out someone, it's publicly shaming them. You're posting it on Twitter, you're putting it on your Facebook feed, it's going viral. Calling in is sometimes more effective. It's a private email or a personal conversation. It's a gentle suggestion or correction that they might not have even been aware that what they did caused offense and that private education can be much more effective than the public shaming because the public shaming produces resistance and fighting back and defending oneself. But talking to a friend, someone whom you trust, who tells you, you know, you really kind of messed up there, that can be more effective in changing the behavior going forward because it's a supportive response instead of an aggressive, challenging, undermining response. And also remember, who has the burden of educating people when they do something wrong? It's not just the minority or the other person, the them who was offended. Sometimes if you're in the us, and someone in your us upsets them, offends them, insults them, maybe you can come to that person and you have credibility because they know you and you're on their team. And if someone on their team says, this is over the line, then maybe they'll listen. Repairing the world begins at home. Talk to your own group. If you see a Jew who dresses in blackface for Purim, don't wait for someone who is a person of color to have to speak to them. Do it yourself. But there's plenty of good jokes out there that are still funny. Who's on first is still funny. And I'll give you one last joke that's a Jewish humanist joke that I don't think makes fun of anybody particularly, but still has a nice punchline at the end. In a very large congregation, there is a senior rabbi and a junior rabbi. And the junior rabbi is fresh out of rabbinical school, like one of our new rabbis being ordained in a couple of weeks. And they're somewhat nervous about how they're going to do at this first high holidays with all those people there. And so the senior rabbi says, don't worry, I've got a plan, it should work fine. We're so full at the synagogue during the high holidays that we actually run two services in two different sections of the building. And so I'll put you with the cantor in the main sanctuary and I'll be in the auxiliary sanctuary, but because the sound can be piped through into both rooms, we can have the cantor, uh, after the sermons are done, lead the Kaddish and everyone will hear his tones of Yit Gadal, the Yit Gadash, it'll go through the whole building and it'll work just fine. But you have to be careful, when you write your sermon, make sure it's exactly 30 minutes long. So Rosh Hashanah comes, the rabbis give up, get up to give their sermons, but the junior rabbi is a little bit nervous, and he reads his sermon a little bit faster, and he finishes in about 25 minutes. And the cantor gets up and begins the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead with Yit Kadal, the Yit Kadash, Shemei Rabbah. Well, after the service, the senior rabbi comes up to the junior rabbi and says, you made a fool out of me. The junior rabbi says, what, what happened in your service? And the senior rabbi said, well, I, I was getting to the peroration, to the peak of my sermon. And I said, there are some people out there who say that God is dead. And what do we say? And then we hear, Yit Gadal, the Yit Gadash, the prayer for the dead. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the ethics of humor.